It's Jay and Stu talk Doctor Who. Yeah. These are the, these are very intricately designed intro sequ intro themes. I, I sing different notes in all of them. I'm <laughs> yeah, not sure what those you know, notes it's a, are. It's to keep the uh, it's to keep it varied. It's to, to keep it interesting every time. You know, to keep yeah, keep it very keep it interesting. Anyway, hello Jay. It's Hello, been a Stuart. while since we've talked to each other. Yes, I, we, we have not already been in a call for an hour. <laughs> no, we haven't been talking. Um, so, yeah, it was you? interesting that that thing that happened last week, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, right. We, we're going to pretend that the, we're recording these a week apart. Okay, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the killer bees um, decided to come and take over the world. Just like in that film, I The mean, Swarm. Per per personally, I welcome our insect overlords. Oh, the Simpsons. <laughs> I've done a Simpsons joke. Anyway, so yeah, the the point of these things is should I exp should I explain what the point of these things are? I mean, people are, people are probably just going to watch the second one right after the first one, aren't they? Um, I don't know. People might be watching this on its own. Okay, basically, the point is we're gonna we've decided to go through each era of Doctor Who and watch a good episode and a bad episode. Yeah. From each era, um, our good ep well, not ep serial rather than episode. And we're ca we're cur we're currently on the second Doctor's era, and we did a bad one last time. Well, sort of bad. We did find something to enjoy in it. Sorry, the bad one we did was the Dominators. If that's the worst the second and... Doctor's era has to offer. I am very much, you know, on board with the whole thing. Well, the other bad one, the other bad ones are missing. So. Because, but then again, if they discover the space pirates, maybe I'd enjoy it if I watched it. I, I don't think that's very likely. No, I don't think that's very likely either. I've heard the soundtrack and I just... I, I remember listening to the soundtrack. I must have listened to the whole thing, but I don't remember anything about it. I, I mean, I remember... Some people do some stupid voices. When we were doing... Because we, when we did this um, last year with William... Or the year before, with, with William Hartnell Stories... We decided to let people vote on what bad second Doctor story we pick. Um, but then I don't think we actually had any... We didn't have enough choices to actually um, make it a vote. Because I remember forbidding you from allowing the Space Pirates to even be a conceivable choice. Because for William Hartnell, we did the Web Planet. And the main yeah, issue I'm, with I'm the Web not... Planet is that it's very boring and nothing happens. And so I don't want to do the Space Pirates to just say the same thing again. Well, I'm not, go I'm not going to listen to the Space Pirates again because I can't be bothered. Exactly. Although I do really, really, really want them... I want the Space Pirates to be the next second Doctor missing serial that they find because I want to watch the Doctor Who fandom tear its hair out trying to be grateful for something that no one likes. Yes. Yeah, just pre pretending to be happy. Pretending to be like, yay, they discovered, they discovered five missing episodes. It's the five missing episodes of the Space Pirates. That would be, it would be yeah. so funny if the BBC announced we've, um, we found five missing episodes of a, of a, of a missing Doctor Who story. Right, every episode yeah. of a missing Doctor Who story, and then they, uh, then they don't announce what it is for a few days. <laughs> and everyone's just trying to figure out what one it was. And you know, you've got someone going, is it Dalek's master plan? And then the and then the BBC goes close. It's the space pirates. <laughs> Hang on, are there what other serials are there that are missing at least five episodes? I'm just having a look. I'm just having a look at what ones are missing. I know this. I know the abominable snowman is missing five episodes. I assume that Disney Plus wants all of Classic Who on their platform and are going to animate every missing serial now. I just, I, I, if, if, if they do employ some animators to waste their lives am sp spending so much time and effort to animating the space pirates, I will be impressed. I, th I think they, are, I think they probably will. Slash, con slash concerned at the abuse of your animators. Well, I mean, space pirates has got to be pretty easy to animate, right? Because nothing actually happens. That's true. Well, what does happen? Do you, you you say that? What does happen in the space pirates, Jay? I don't know. There's like some. There's like a. It's like a bit where a ship goes somewhere, right? 
and there's a space pirate and he comes along and he goes, Arg, I'm a space pirate. I'm going to steal your bounty. Exactly. That's the plot. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think. Hmm? No, there's two. Are there two surviving episodes of Wheel in Space? I'm trying to figure out what other episodes are missing five. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, two episodes of Wheel in Sp- yeah two episodes of Wheel in Space exist. So yeah, it's just the Space Pirates and the Bonneville Snowmen, I think. Anyway, the mind. Someone in robber. chat will tell me I'm wrong. Anyway, the mind robber. Yeah, Stuart. Psychedelics were popular in the sixties. Yeah, psychedelics psychedelics were popular in the sixties, which is. The, 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 then again, I mean, it's easy to just say, "Hey, maybe that, maybe that was the explanation for some trippy thing that you watched." Well, it's like, <coughs> I mean, I was much more. I, I found uh, myself much more interested in part one than I was in um, any of the other parts. Although that's not to say I didn't oh, part, like the other parts. Part one of the Mind Robber is one of the greatest episodes of Doctor Who ever made. It's so suspenseful and weird and interesting. Basically, um, the TARDIS has the TARDIS gets submerged in lava from the volcano eruption at the end of the last story, um, and can't dematerialize properly. So the Doctor has to use like an emergency dematerialization that just takes them outside of space and time. Um, and there's supposed to be nothing there, but then there's some kind of entity outside the TARDIS <laughs> when and when they've supposedly landed nowhere trying to tempt everyone to go outside how creepy is that it's wonderful it's a modern it's a modern day doctor who retelling of the siren story from you know ancient greek mythology you know the sirens calling sailors to um their island yeah um and it's so atmospheric and creepy and it it's genuinely really tense yeah and it's it's particular particularly the ending where jamie and zoe are basically they're wandering around in this white void where nothing exists and then they then they get surrounded by these robots and then it some somewhere beyond in the white void they see carbon copies of themselves which start beckoning come join us and then you just hear Zoe screaming over this shot, and it's genuinely one of the freakiest shots I've ever seen in Doctor Who. It really is. Um, they they also have like they paint the TARDIS prop white as well for this like I, I mean, it's made probably a different prop, but you know, to have like a a, a, a soulless carbon copy of the TARDIS. It's genuinely so good. I just I. <sighs> It, yeah, it it's 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 one of the it's one of the even though the next parts aren't like horrible, but it's sort of you know I was I was hooked. yeah pretty much it's it it's one of the it's one of the best examples of creating something in a hurry. It's sort of it's sort of like so we've had to cut one episode off of the Dominators because we didn't have enough material, so we got to write this thing, and we got they basically had nothing that they could use for it, so they had blank set, nothing, no budget. Even the monsters, the white robots, were reused from another BBC production. It's this show. It was this show called Out of the Unknown, which is a sci-fi anthology show. So they basically, they basically, this was just like creative hey, clutching at straws, and, and you know they what? created something fucking incredible. That actually, the fact that they're from another sci-fi show, really works given the context of this story, given what the yes, it does. Is. It's. They're literally in a, a world of fiction. Getting a thing from another BBC show and putting it just slap in there really works. I yeah, would... and I think I also I also think the the original production that they took those robots from it ended up getting junked, so you can't watch it anymore. Oh, well, that's a shame. Yeah, which is a shame, but it also kind of adds to the mystique of it. I think it does. It does. Anyway, the next yeah. four parts are more um, sort of meandering, but they're still oh, but they're, very there's, good. Ha- hang very on, fun. Uh, another part, 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 another another thing that I love in episode one when he's taking the TARDIS out of time. Um, he said, he says, um, 
as the function it's incredibly dangerous it's inc incredibly dangerous it takes us out of reality and then jamie says well reality's getting too hot right now doctor <laughs> that's such a i love I that as a quip yeah reality's getting too hot <laughs> It's such like a trailer narrator quip <laughs> when reality is getting too getting... hot to handle. <laughs> Let's take the TARDIS out of time, and it lands in a white void. And and the monitors start showing. The monitors start showing that th this is the one thing that part part what part one gets really really right is they don't show what's call calling Jamie and Zoe outside for like the first half of it. So you got Jamie and Zoe trapped inside the TARDIS, and the monitors start showing them their home outside of the TARDIS. That's that's what's calling them outside. Yeah. You don't you don't you don't see the bad guy in any of this bit. You just you just see that you just feel this invisible force that's calling them outside. And I think that's what the rest of the serial fails at because they show you who's controlling the Doctor well, I mean... and. Jamie and Zoe's movements. At some point, you're going to have to give some kind of explanation for what is going on, but I, I do feel you don't that necessarily is true. have to show it, right? Or you could show something, but th not necessarily explain what it is, you know, uh, other than the information that's necessary for the story. You could still leave mystery. Um, yeah, that is true, but part one works so well because you don't see any of it. Yeah. It's just, it's just this atmospheric force that you feel. But it does, it does, you know, it does set up the uh, the ending quite well. The thing is that the story is so long that by the time I got to part five, and, you know, I was watching these back to back. I was not a, a 1960s viewer who had to wait a week for each one of these to air. Watching these back to back, the story was so long that by the time I got to uh, part five and we were getting the explanation for, like, why this stuff was happening, most of this stuff was, like, pretty much out of my mind. Um, and I wasn't going, oh, that's why that happened. I was going... Okay, this is this this is the ending then. But you know, maybe that's just because my brain isn't working at the moment. Well, you are sick, so yeah. That the, the this is but this is this is probably the best sort of thing to watch when you're sick. Something psychedelic it, from the sixties. It really did kind of feel like I was having a fever dream, and I've never said that <laughs> in a way that wasn't like it's supposed to be mean before. Just like neutral statement. Watching this felt like a fever dream. Um, not quality positive or negative. I did really like it, though. Um, there yeah, were, like, that... like, my biggest criticism of it is that, there, well, I think it's too long. To, to It kind of is meandering towards, you know, well... Well, it kind, well it kind of... It... It kind of it does it does it in spite in spite of episode one being the result of creative scrambling that was just a work of genius. It it, it is it is also compromised by the state of the production, as in. Yeah. One episode of the Dominators had to be knocked off. We had a week of programming to fill, so we got to somehow stretch this out on, into a four-part episode into five parts. Because um, you will know, you will notice that each each of the five parts is actually slightly shorter than usual. I did notice that. Um, yeah, in fact, part five is the shortest episode of Classic Doctor Who. Interesting. So when you, when they arrive, I mean, there's there's, there's loads of stuff that's like. You could have done, like, a lot of this in just, like, one part. Um, we're going to have to talk about Jamie's face at some point. Um, they yeah. have, like, a bit where they go through, like, three trials, um, and they meet, like, a unicorn, and they get um, attacked by it, and they just have to say, oh, it's not real, and then it disappears. And then they do the same thing with, like... Um, oh, what else? What was this? A, a minotaur. And then they do the same thing with uh, uh, Medusa. And it's like, this is all, like very like each encounter is quite spread apart but ultimately they these these could have been like you know three consecutive rooms that they walk into one after the other and it could have been like a four minute scene um but it's like a lot of the story is dedicated to them exploring this place walking through finding another of these threats and then um dealing with it by saying it's not real or whatever true just um, sort of exploring this landscape but ultimately, I do like the payoff of that when they then get um, a fictional character that the Doctor isn't familiar with, um, where Zoe goes... It's funny, that was. It's like, I am Carcass. But I, the... but I can't say that it's not real because I've never heard of him. Yeah, it's, it's really funny. 
<laughs> so I was going, don't go on, Doctor, just do what you do with the others. You know he's not real. He's like, I, I don't, I've never heard of him. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as, as opposed to the Dominators, which a lot of the dialogue in the Dominators is just very stupid, a lot of this, a lot of the dialogue in this one is actually kind of too clever for its own good in places. Like, there's the, um, there's the infamous bit where, um, where he get he gets those visual clues where it's Jamie is safe safe and well, and he sees a safe and there's a well. It's yes, it's which just made me laugh out loud. It sort of, of presents him with the presents him with this visual problem. <clears throat> um, you have what you have Gulliver there as well. You have um a forest made up. I I don't you know why was there a forest made of tree stumps that spelled out proverbs? Why was that there? I do not remember, because it's a land of fiction, Jay. It's a land made up of fiction. Oh, and the co I, I did think it was really cool that Gulliver can only speak using words from the book. Yeah, uh, it is really that cool. Was a really, th there's just lots of really cool little details in this one. It was obviously written by a literary nerd. Who likes psychedelics. Who's into psychedelics, yes. Yeah, should we talk? Should we talk about Jamie's face? This is another yeah. of those so, creative. This is another of those creative scrambling to get out of a out of a situation that we're in because. Part two. Um, well, well, oh, okay, okay, I'll let you go. Yeah. Part two is one that doesn't really feel like it needs to be there at all. You could probably cut most of the things that happen in it, and the story would be the same. Um, you you would just go. You could just go straight into part three where they start meeting like the unicorn and stuff. Um. Or they, well, that's, you know, that's where they would start meeting the unicorn and stuff and cut all of the events from part two and the story would be the same. Really. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. There's, part... yeah, that, that's true. There isn't really a reason for Jamie's face to change. Well, no, yeah. So part two, um, knowing, the, knowing the backstory behind this made this episode a lot less con confusing, I feel. Because, yeah, you were going to say, right, Fraser Hines wasn't available for a week or something? Yeah, he had a week's leave. So basically what they had to do was write a reason for him to be played by another actor. I love that they did that rather than just have him not be there. <laughs> because they open, yes. the episode opens with the Doctor, Jamie and Zoe are separated. Um, so there's... So, like... And, you know, they don't even reunite for, like, most of the episode, right? For, like, for like the first half of the episode, at least, they're not reunited. So they could have just rescripted it that Jamie didn't show up right until the end. Or, the, you know, even to tell the, part in the next part. But they have it so that Jamie gets shot by a fictional character whose gun, for reasons that are not explained ever... <laughs> turns him into a cardboard cutout of himself, which then its face disappears. And then the doctor is given a puzzle to rearrange Jamie's face using like mismatched bits of, of random faces. He has, the doctor has to reassemble Jamie's face. And because the doctor gets it wrong, Jamie is then played by another actor for a while until he gets shot again and the Doctor gets another try. <laughs> this is okay, as so bizarre. As pointless, as, pointless, as pointless as it is for the overall direction of the story, have you ever seen anything like it before? No, I haven't. I, and I, that's why I'm willing to just like accept that this happens because, you know, within the context of they're in like an imaginary realm of fiction... Um, where just uh, absurd psychedelic things happen. Yeah, you know what? This is a perfectly. This is perfectly. This is allowed. This is fine. He get he gets shot and gets turned into a cardboard cutout. Yeah, fine. Yeah, why not? That's just how it works. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. At that point, I immediately just because Jamie draws a switchblade. At that point, have we ever had a Doctor Who companion that carries a knife before or after? Leela. Yeah, Leela, Leela. Yeah, it's Leela and Jamie are the only ones that carry a knife. We need a, we need another. Yeah, not guns, just knives. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Graham had like a butter knife with him at all times to make sandwiches. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be surprised with that at all. 
He wouldn't care if Switch played though. Uh, I, I believe oh, yeah, that Dan. Really funny. There I is... believe that Dan would like carry carry like plastic cutlery, believing he could use it for self defense. Yeah, probably actually. Oh yeah, I I did laugh when Zoe. When, when it cuts to Zoe and she's walking um, through the landscape and then she opens a door and she walks through the door and finds there's no floor to it. Wait, what? When is this? Yeah, she. Yeah, in episode two, she opens a door and she walks through and just and, and just falls and goes, ah! You don't see her falling. I don't remember that at all. Well, that's just how weird this episode is. There are, oh, yeah, no, what it's am well, I've got, no, go on, go on. I was going to go with... Um, this is, like, one of my biggest uh, issues with this story, is that the dialogue does feel a little um, emotionless and stilted at times to me. Where you have things like um, Zoe reacting to Jamie having a totally different face now. She's just sort of like, who is this? And the doctor's like, this is Jamie, he has a different face now. And she's like, oh, why? And you're like, I feel like... I feel like this could have been redrafted. I'm not sure what, what she should be saying in this situation, but I get the impression that this isn't really it. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah, it's like Jay. J, if imagine if you woke up and just one day your significant other had a different face, what would you say? Um, I probably wouldn't believe it was them. Yeah, but they were saying it was them. I, I would probably get concerned. <laughs> yeah, but what would you literally say, legitimately, like emotionally? I would. Would you go? I would, ah! I would require them to basically prove to me that it was them. Yes, but what? Would, yeah, yeah, but the point. The point is, you're saying that Zoe's not acting proper, acting properly. Um, well, you're, you're, shocked you're by this. What would like... you? What would your legit? What would your literal words be if they said, "Hello, I'm." This person that you, the, this person that you know really well. I, do, I, I would, I would, <laughs> I would say, who are you and what the fuck are you doing? Well, you can't get away with that on nineteen sixties tele children's television, can Paraphrase you? Paraphrase it. Or just have a loud, True, yeah. a loud, conveniently timed noise in the background. See, I didn't notice. See, I didn't really notice that because I was just like already absorbed in the weird, crazy nightmare logic of this. Because like, there's this bit where a bunch of children come up to the doctor and they just start asking him, they just start speaking, telling him riddles and jokes, and they start laughing at him. Yeah, uh, I never really got that why that happened, but it is a really fun it's just, scene. It's just creepy, isn't it? I don't know. I didn't find it creepy. I just found it sort of fun. Um, where he just goes, yeah. Where um, well, they all start pinching him. Oh anyway, yeah, we have then we have part three where they 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 meet their trials. They meet, what is it? Does, is Medusa, or is Medusa in part four? Uh, no, Medusa's part three, I think, because they go into the labyrinth. Yeah, they go to the labyrinth where they meet the Minotaur, and they're like, the Minotaur's not real, so don't worry about it. Then no, but there's oh, there's this really cute bit. There's this really cute bit where um the Doctor and Zoe start going through the labyrinth, and he says to the Doctor, "I I don't think we need to be too alarmed." And he says that while he's hugging Zoe and shivering. I do, this is this era is like the closest that the Doctor Who has ever been to just being Scooby Doo. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I mean, that's with with Zoe not really reacting to um, Jamie's face. I quite like that characters just have, just just can say ridiculous things with completely <coughs> straight faces in this episode. I, don't, I feel like I feel like, like there should be more intent behind it, though. I feel like I should, you know, um, I feel like I should get a handle on what it, what Zoe is actually feeling about this. If if she was just so done with this situation that she's like going. Okay, Jamie's got a different face, sure. You know, it's. I guess it's been that kind of day. Um, well, yeah, because yeah, cause at the end of the previous episode, she the TARDIS breaks up, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, she, You know, she could even be having, like, a, a moment of, like, I'm not even sure that any of this is actually happening. I think I might be having some weird, like, psychotic episode and hopefully I wake up soon. Um... <laughs> 
but like yeah I, I don't really I don't really understand what she's going through in this story at all I don't understand I don't get any real impression of how any of this affects her True, it is just a trippy landscape for the Doctor and Co to wander through, isn't it? She is also just like the very stereotypical, like she is the most stereotypical screamer that the, the, the Doctor Who has, has had, I feel. Mm. There's a point where in this, she's, she's, I mean, she's like book smart, but she's so like practically useless in terms of actually helping with stuff. There's a point where the Doctor volunteers to help her by carrying her over a tripwire. That that happens. The dog is like, oh, there's a tripwire. You don't want to step step on that. And he put picks her up and puts her down on the other side of it. It's, oh yeah, that was fun. It's it's very much woman written in the sixties moment. Yeah, yeah, true. I see that. The story just sort of happens to Zoe, and she doesn't really have many opinions about it. Hmm, true. Anyway, in, in part three, we have uh, Jamie meet Rapunzel, but, and then... Yeah, we, in, it, I, loved, I loved that, when he's climbing up her hair, and he gets all the way to the top of it, and he realises he's been climbing her hair, and she just says, ouch! <laughs> yeah. Like, with a complete straight face, just, ouch! You've been climbing my hair, ouch! So, yeah, he, he meets Rapunzel, and then, but Rapunzel, and then she lets him in, and then she's not there anymore, and actually where he is, is like, um, like the central hub where everything is being, is being operated from or whatever, um, or at least a part of it, and he, he finds like the, the fiction that's being written because they're trying to write, this is the, this is one of the plot points where I'm like, okay, what was this, guys? They're trying to write the Doctor... They're trying to write stories about the Doctor before they happen so that they can make the Doctor fictional. Yes. <laughs> that is nonsense. That That's just a <laughs> random <laughs> string of words. Um, I know. And surely for their goals, I... they don't even want the Doctor to be fictional. They need him to be real. <laughs> this is why I picked this one. I just wanted to. I just wanted to listen to you tear your hair out trying to understand <laughs> what the fuck it's talking about. Well, yeah, I, I, I really, I really chose a great day to watch this. My brain not working too well. If I'd watched it yesterday, I would probably have because I was feeling better yesterday. I guess, I guess that was like the eye of the storm for me being ill. Um, yeah, but like. I would probably have had a, a much easier time comprehending it. Not, you know, a walk in the park because it, it, what the fuck is this? But like, it wouldn't it wouldn't have been as much of an ordeal as I had. Just, I didn't count. But the number of times where I thought, "Hang on, I have no idea what just happened or why," and then scrolled back a couple of minutes to rewatch what happened. A lot. And it still doesn't go in. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I did do that multiple times for some scenes. Yeah, although I did, I did notice some interesting things about it. Like the like when um, the Doctor first meets Gulliver, he starts speaking in lots of different languages, and the Doctor doesn't understand him. And then I thought, oh yeah, it's because the TARDIS broke up, so it, he's not getting the translation in his head oh, anymore, yeah. is he? That, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. That's that's. I, I, I just watched that and thinking, why isn't the TARDIS translating? And didn't even have the brainwave of like, oh yeah, because it blew up. Right. Uh, so that, that I, I think the TARDIS breaking up lends it this degree of danger. It does. You know, they, they haven't got a way home. Although it does just it does just sort of appear again at the end. I feel like they should have lent that in, in, into that more, you know. Have the, the characters actually more troubled by that fact. Hmm, yeah. You are, yeah. Your your point about Zoe is entirely right. It, it, even even to the point where they do the when it's a door, not a door. When it's a jar, and then you see her inside of a jar. And then they're just making fun of her for being in the jar, <laughs> <laughs> which does make me laugh. It's it it's more it's more visual humor than it is a story. The mind robber. 
Yeah. The story is is weird. It's so weird. Um, and like, if if anyone here hasn't seen the Mind Robber, like normally I I do my best. Um, we do our best, I guess, to explain the story as we go, so that people who are maybe you know maybe haven't seen it in a while, or maybe even haven't seen it at all, um, can just follow along with what we're talking about. It's not that I'm not trying to do that here but i don't feel that it's actually possible to explain this story coherently no it's just gibberish and you just have to let your mind go um it's it's so I just please watch this one if you want to understand us talking about it yeah like there's literally a point where the doctor disarms a, a, an enemy by saying that his weapon is impossible, and then suddenly the, the oh, that's weapon really just disappears. Good, though. I love that bit. That's really fun. The, yeah. Um, everything with carcass is like my, the carcass scene is one of my favorite scenes from this whole thing. So yeah, yeah. Everything about that is just this guy shows up. And he's like, "Hi, I'm Carcass," <laughs> and oh yeah. Yeah, he's like this. He's like the, he's like this um, fictional superhero from the future, from where Zoe's from. So, well, it's from the year 2000, Stuart. Yes, the year 2000. You remember the year 2000? Yeah, and I love that he's so fundamentally With a the cheeky of girls the and everything. Oh, yeah, totally. But I do, like the, I do like the idea that in Zoe's future, the sci fi is still completely stupid. Yeah. So he's uh, like, I am the carcass. I, I will destroy you. So, I also love that there's basically nothing, like, it, it's clearly, like, his name is Carcass, but they never do anything with that. Like, that's not a point. I guess, in the fictional work of fiction in which he exists, there might be something to do with the fact that he's called Carcass. Like, you know, maybe he's, like, a reanimated corpse or something. But, like... Hang on, has he appeared in any Doctor Who expanded media? Oh, I'd love it if he had. But yeah, I, I do really now. love the fact that he's pointing a gun at the Doctor and Zoe, and, the, and Zoe explains, uh, the Doctor's like, what kind of gun is that, Zoe? And Zoe says, oh, it's just, it's a, it's, it strings a load of science words together, and the Doctor says, well, that can't exist, it's impossible. And then the next shot is Carcass... Ha realizing that he's no longer holding a gun because when you don't believe in something in the world of fiction, it doesn't exist. So it's it's great. It's it's a, I, I adore this scene and the dialogue is so snappy as well. Apparently, action figures of the carcass were produced. What? Oh no, that's I was part of an as part of an audio thing. He's been referenced a couple of times, but never. No, this is the only. This is the only story he appears in. Well, I mean, you know, it makes sense because he is fictional. Like he's he's within universe. He is a fictional character. Yeah, that's true. I want to see more of him though. Uh, right. His um his. Wait, he's not, He's got a superheroes fandom wiki. Oh, does he? Apparently. We all follow his strip in the hourly telepress. What is a telepress? I like is that, that like a smartphone. I like that it's specified in his um in his article on um superhero wiki, the carcass is a fictional superhero who appears in the TV series Doctor Who and the Mind Rubber. I get what they mean by that, but fam, all superheroes are fictional. The carcass is a fictional fictional superhero. It's. I do love how meta this episode is. Nicholas Briggs has played him. Really? The, it's, on the superhero wiki, it says the carcass was played by Christopher Robbie in the TV series and Nicholas Briggs in the audio dramas. Oh, I guess he appears in some audio dramas then. Well, they have revisited the obviously... world of fiction quite a few times. Because Nicholas Briggs plays everybody. He does. He is actually play. He plays. He's played the Ninth Doctor. In the Ninth Doctor, he has been, um, 
Alpha Centauri, probably. Um, he's been in Iris Wild Thyme and the Claws of S- Santa. That's the audio he appears in. And he, oh, he's in Legend of the Cybermen. I don't remember him being there, but I guess I didn't know who he was, so I wouldn't have remembered because I haven't listened to that story for like a couple of years. Oh, yeah, that was the sequel to um, Land of Fiction they did, wasn't it? It was. It's a very, it's a very, it's very in spirit of the original. So. Yeah, one thing, one thing that we haven't mentioned is the occasional appearance of this master. Oh yeah, He just right. sort of shows up. He, well, he just I, sort of shows up. It shows up in occasional shots, like controlling aspects of the land of fiction. He goes, find not, them. That's not actually him, though, is it? That's that's just the guy. the The master refers to the master brain, doesn't it? Yeah, the master refers to the master brain, but characters keep on saying the master, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> they do. It catches you off guard with the context of the next fifty years of who. Yeah, because the master didn't exist at this point. Yeah. Um, and you know, it is so we can a thing te- that a person might be called or referred to as. Yeah, people, yeah, Gulliver keeps on talking about the master of this place, the master. Well, I wonder if anyone has ever gone back, um, and watched this or like has been doing classic coup in order or whatever. I, I assume it must have happened to a few people that they know who the master is. And then it must have watched this and assumed that the actual, this was going to be the master's first appearance. Yeah. So and we can, te- we can technically the say that, um. It's actually... this, this actor called hmm? this actor called M. Reese Jones. He was the original master. He was. Unless another character is referred to as the master earlier in who. Anyway. So yeah, the. <laughs> The, oh yeah, the, I've just I've just written down I've just written down a quote because you were talking you were talking about the plan is to make the doctor into fiction. Yeah, I've just written down a quote that says, "If we had done what the master says, we would have become fiction." And then Zoe says, "Oh, that's horrible." It's like, what does that mean? No, it would yeah, be I horrible to become fiction. I don't really understand how Zoe comprehends what the fuck that means. Um, <laughs> like. I don't understand how you can have that immediate of a reaction to that concept. You would become (laughs) fictional. I I, I, know. I feel like I would say, what? But yeah, so um, the doctor has said, right. um, The doctor says, it's it's explained. This is like the most nonsensical part of the story. Like a lot of it is like trippy and weird. This is just incomprehensible. Um, The doctor explains it by saying, so when something is written down after it happens, that's called history. And Jamie says, yes. And the Doctor says, well, something is written down before it happens. That's fiction. And that's all the explanation we get as to why they're trying to write down what they think the Doctor is going to do next. And if they do it right, apparently he becomes fictional. Um, And there's even a part in part five where the Doctor is like, is now more in control of the land of fiction. And he tries to refer, he tries to like mention himself in a sentence and says, oh, I can't do that. I will become fictional. Um, and then doesn't try to redraft the sentence in a way that just doesn't mention him because he is in no way actually important to what he's talking about. Um, it's, it's, true. it's very strange. It is very strange. And it, do- it basically doesn't make any sense at all, especially especially since, oh, God. At the, at the end of episode four, where Jamie and Zoe get crushed inside a giant book. That's a much more fun way to make um, characters fictional, I think. Um, to have... Yeah, crush them yeah. inside of a book. So they meet the um, the master and there's like one real person who... Um, so there's this like big computer brain that's like running this place. And it needs like an actual human servant to actually have imagination and be creative to fill the world with like fictional characters. Um, and to like write the events that happen. And I like that. That's fun. It's a fun little thing. Um, and they're trying to... Um, the brain is trying to replace this guy because he's getting on a bit with the doctor. Uh, and that's what all of like the intelligence tests were for and stuff. Uh, to make sure that he was suitable. 
But then they don't want Jamie or Zoe, so they just make them fictional by having two robots crush them to death in a giant book. That's literally what <laughs> happens. That's the story. Um, I'm not... That's not a joke. Here it is. What book is it? <laughs> uh, I can't remember. I think it's Gulliver's Travels. I can't remember. Oh, that would make sense. But, like... I like I like them being and then, crushed and, in the giant and, book and then becoming fictional characters within the universe. And then fiction. they and then they yeah and then they show up and like Gulliver they can only speak in language that they've already used. Yeah, um, but like and I like I like them crushing them in a book method because it's not pretending to be some kind of like logical thing that would turn you fictional. It's just like yeah, this is a weird place where this kind of thing can happen because this is like this strange crazy nightmare realm if you're crushed in a book you become like one of these weird constructs of like a fictional character i, I way prefer that uh yeah but yeah so we've got the the, the doctor in in this room now with the uh, the master and the brain Oh, and uh, one bit that I really liked in episode five was this master actually does it. He, 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 he. he does. He he really he really gives it to this role. Mm. It would have been cool if he'd actually if they'd actually got him back and had him actually play the master at one point. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, I would have liked that. Um, so they have like um. So they have so they get the doctor and they try to plug him into the master brain so that he can be the brain who is creating like the um imagination to fuel like the world of fiction but then he's like you fool you've given me too much control over this realm by doing that and he starts writing things to his advantage to try and help think him escape which is so meta and i i adore it as a as like a, a final confrontation where it's literally you know when kids play like let's pretend games and they're like i was thinking that yeah, yeah it's like but then suddenly his gun was out of ammo and it was useless it's it is literally that it's you know one kid will go i have a, a fire sword and then the other kid goes well i have a magic shield that can defeat your fire it's it's that um where the doctor is trying to write it so that he escapes the Doctor is currently writing the story that he is in, trying to make it so that he escapes. Um, and so, yeah, he, he writes, fucking, the carcass comes back to help Jamie and Zoe so, you know, they don't, they don't get hurt. And then the Master Brain is like, ah, but then the carcass turns on Jamie and Zoe to kill them. And then the Doctor goes, but he's out of ammo, so he can't do anything. It's, it's unironically great. <laughs> Yeah, I love this scene. I love that scene. It's a really fun way for this for the final confrontation to take place. Um, and then it just sort of ends. Uh, the doctor yeah, does that's escape. It. It, it, hmm? It's just sort of the. It's just sort of they. It's just sort of the TARDIS then just shows up for no reason. I mean, you know, I mean, it, 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 and everything's it, fine it is now. explained that they like, um, I actually can't, like they, they, they overload the master brain. I actually can't remember how, I think there is a way that they do it, but they I genuinely can't remember how. Um, then the realm of fiction is like really broken and destroyed. And then because there's nothing there anymore, the TARDIS returns to them is how it's presented. But there is Yeah, what I would have done... The ending that I would have done, which I would really love, is they get back inside the TARDIS and they try to go somewhere and then they realise that the TARDIS is now fictional so they can't go anywhere. But then they wouldn't have then wouldn't be able to do another story, Stuart. That would No, but then I would then I would then I would just have it end and we never explain it. So then the rest of the show is essentially fictional and trapped inside this land of fiction. Well it's weird because it's not like any like final closing scene right where you know the TARDIS just reappears and then it cuts to credits it's like you know there's no like pretty much it's so rare now that you get that where there's not like a final scene of like characters thinking about the events of the story or talking about like what they've gone through or something here it is just like yeah then they got out yeah, goodbye it's, it's, we're done now um yeah 
Uh, but like, you know, I, I would love to see a final scene where they have a tongue in cheek joke where um, they're like, ah, thank God we've escaped and we're not fictional. I don't know, that could be fun. Anyway, we've, got, we've done the whole story now. Yeah, chat. I think that's basically all I have to say about it. Chat, do you feel... Has anyone in chat not seen this? And if so, how do you feel about what you've just heard? And also, uh, we need to... We need to um, because we did it... We we're going to do it with polls, right? For the um, good story and the bad story that we watched. So we need a poll for the good third Doctor story that we watch, we need four uh, four options and four options for the bad story. Okay, what are my recommendations? We'll, um, we'll nominate two each as we have done before. Okay. Um, right, good third Doctor stories. Hang on, I sent you lists of my nominations. I can't remember where I put them. I, I also don't remember that happening, so I can't be help any help. Oh yeah, okay, my bad recommendation is The Time Monster. Oh, that is a good one. And my good recommendation is Inferno. Alright, um... My... Bad recommendation is... Hmm... And there's so many bangers, that's the issue. Uh... Death to the Daleks. And my good recommendation is Oh no wait, no, we need two bad we need we need two bad each and two good each. Oh, okay. Hang on a minute. Let me bring it up. Right, do, do you wanna put the do you wanna put one poll on your Twitter and I'll put one poll on my Twitter? Okay, let's do that. Um hang on a sec. I'm gonna uh, do the doctor. bad one on my Twitter. Okay, I'll okay. You do the bad one on your Twitter, and I'll do the good one on my one. Right. So my t my two bad recommendations for third Doctor stories will be the Time Monster and what else is rubbish in the third Doctor's era? Death of the Daleks. But you can't have that. It's mine. Yeah. No, Death of the Daleks is rubbish. Um. I'm rare in liking. Uh, I, I'm rare in. I'm rare that I like Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Um, I remember. I would recommend the monster. Invasion I would. I would recommend. I would recommend the monster of Peloton as bad, but it's just I don't want to watch it again. Fair. Uh, what about that like weird big finish one where he uh, doesn't. Uh... Where where he where he uh, like he advocates for like genocide or something. There is that. I I don't remember that. I don't know. It's like a, it's one where he like, I can't. I can, it's not. He doesn't literally advocate for genocide. But he does advocate for something extremely iffy. I can't remember what though. All right, sorry. I'm just gonna say the mutants and the time monster. It's the mutants bad. I I don't remember. I can't anything remember anything about, about it. Right, and my final bad recommendation. I don't want to put Frontier in the spa in, in space on there, even though I think it's a, a bad story. Well, not not horrible, but you know, I don't think I think it's extremely overrated as a story. Okay, well, my good ones would be Inferno and yeah, Inferno and Green Death, I think. All right, my good ones will be. Uh... Carnival of Monsters and Dude, that's a good one. Inferno. No, I said Inferno. Oh, so you did. <laughs> right, yes. Oh, I'm so clever. Um then Doctor Who and the Silurians. Yeah, okay, that's a good choice. So we just need one more bad one. Chat, what's a bad John Pertwee story? I'm actually struggling with this. Like, you know, I don't think the Sea Devils is very good. No, I don't think it's very good. All right, that can be it then.
All right, I'll let the poll go up for seven days. All right, and everyone go go vote on what you want to see us cover next. Stuart, are you putting the uh, the one on your... Vote for the next good third Doctor story for our next stream. All righty. Okay. Okay, I've posted mine. So go vote, everyone. You've got seven days on mine. Stuart, how long do they have on yours? Yeah, I put uh, 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> uh, no, seven days. I'm excited. Well, all right. Uh, Stuart, all right I, think that's, I think that's what's done. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. In, I'm got... Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's time for me to do the theme tune. Yeah. Okay. Zen 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 zen